You know, for my whole childhood, I had been told that basically everything about our psychology is socially constructed, mm -hmm. right? It's what schools teach you, it's what your parents teach you, it's what your friends said yeah. to you. There's clearly a huge role of that in human psychology. Back in the day, it's harder to find someone and easier to keep someone. There's a lot of people who have this perception that, oh my gosh, dating is just harder than ever. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the mating market has gotten so bad and it's like, mate, when was it ever easy? They took university students and measured their BMI preferences, male university students, and measured their BMI preferences before and after dinner. And before dinner, the men preferred heavier women. Welcome back to the Sample Podcast, guys, the number one social dynamics podcast in the world. Today with me, I flew all the way down to Melbourne to interview one person I've seen on TikTok. I've been consuming his content, and he gives an interesting perspective where most of the time in this space, you hear the same rhetoric over and over again. To have someone that has a fresh take so you can listen, you can understand, you can consume, and you can take whatever is useful for you and be able to implement it in your life for not only social skills, your dating life, your relationships, as well as your networking. Today with me, I have Mr. Mac and Murphy. Hi, Samuel. Thanks for having me on. I like Appreciate it. it. Use my full name. I like it. Hey, well, no. what do you normally go by, Sam? Sam. I usually go by Sam. Oh, I'll, I'll let me take my foot out of my mouth. No, I'll, no, I'll call no, you no, Sam no. For us. Yeah. Instagram. You know when Instagram now made the blue check yeah. mark available? Yeah. The full name had to be exposed. So I was Oh, like, what a disaster. So now everyone's oh. calling me Samuel. Yeah, well, my full name's Mackenzie. So that, just kidding. It's not. But. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah. So for the people listening, one of the things that I noticed when I did a lot of research about you. Number one, you've been to a lot of universities. You've, you've been to, I was just like, usually one person has one university. Talk us through that area of your life to start with because I think it's very prevalent to pe for people to know your level of expertise in the subjects we're gonna be covering today. Okay, no, that's fine. I mean, I've been, um, I've been studying human mating behavior in formal academic settings for years and years. Uh, I started at Boston University. That's where I was introduced to the field of evolutionary psychology. Uh, my degree was in biological anthropology, and I had a lot of really great professors there who were quite focused on mating as, as a topic. Mm -hmm. And so I got to take some classes that were very interesting. It became a bit of a passion. And then, you know, I, uh, I served in the AmeriCorps immediately after that. And, I, you know, I was, I was a cook for a little bit. I, I kind of didn't know what to do with my time. Yep. Uh, but then after that, I, I, you know, applied for Oxford, um, ended up going there for a master's program. And, there I really doubled down and became just completely obsessed with these topics and studied them as hard as I possibly could. And now I'm very grateful to be at the University of Melbourne where you know I'm doing research as a PhD student. Amazing. Yeah. A lot of people take a path of they find a particular book, they find something that really got them into it. What was your like moment where it just clicked, the obsession became like real to you? You were like, oh my God, this is exactly what I want to study or was it a long procedure where it just took a multiple years and you fell further and further down the rabbit hole? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think, I think what happened to me was that parents teach you, it's what your friends said yeah. to you. And it's like, oh, you know, that, that and, and that's, that's, there's, I'm not, you know, denigrating that role. There's clearly a huge role of that in human psychology, right? Mm -hmm. It comes up over and over again. But then when I got to college, really for the first time, I was reminded of the fact that humans are animals. Right? It was like, oh my gosh, of course we're animals. And when you look at a duck's behavior, you don't think about like, oh, what did the duck parents teach them? What mm. did you know, the duck friends <laughs> teach them? Yeah. Uh, what, what was the duck social system doing? Right? I mean, those, thing, those factors are obviously, I'm, I'm, being a little, um, I'm being a little snarky there because obviously you know, we have those factors in humans and they are genuinely mm. big factors. But the first thing you think is, oh, evolution, instincts, right? those sorts of things. Uh, partially instinctual or largely instinctual drives and motivations that are instilled in the animal, partially genetically. And so looking at human behavior, it's like, well, if humans are animals, we really should at least give some attention to that aspect of behavior. Mm. And the thing that was really compelling for me initially was actually, uh, well, there were, there were two things I could talk about, but I think the simpler topic to talk about is just... Uh, Universal, universal trends in human mate preferences. Mm -hmm. That was the, the, the one of two things that I heard immediately where I was like, oh, well, it really can't be socially constructed or culturally constructed if every society and culture has this, wants the same things. I mean, there's obviously cultural variation, right? 
but it's of the same thing almost. Yeah, but exactly of the same thing. Like it's it's yeah, to an extent, physical attractiveness standards vary, but most people at least want someone who is physically attractive, mm. right? And that's kind of peculiar. Why 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 would that be true, right? Uh, it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. It doesn't make that much sense just from a purely cultural perspective. You know, most people want someone who's socially compatible with them, and that might mean different things in different cultures, right? Depending on your religious background, <laughs> that sort of thing. But the fact that everyone wants someone who is compatible, well, the fact that that's universal implies that there's some underlying uh, drives there. Uh, for physical attractiveness, for what it's worth, just to summarize in case anyone's wondering, like, what, why, why would that be evolved? It does seem to be... Uh, cues to health or at least cues to not unhealthy right mm -hmm. in many ways and then other things such as you know cues to formidability and things like that and and abilities specific abilities as well as fertility right so there's the, that's kind of part at least part of the suite of things going on there where we have evolved desires to seek those things and then with compatibility it's like look humans are largely monogamous not entirely but largely monogamous pair bonding animals and we co-raise children right mm. so of course you want someone who's compatible because that's like the hardest job ever to, to work together on. Now, it, it, you know, it varies. I, the, the nuclear family is, is really largely socially constructed. That mm. doesn't seem to be the natural human pattern. But the idea that you would have mom and dad both involved in a child's upbringing, that, you know, that's, that's relatively natural. But yeah, no, I, I love how you, you dived into that idea of there are certain characteristics we like about people. Yeah. So um, even even as the years have gone on, I found it very interesting where even when I first started getting into this whole uh, spirit, like, you know, sort of area to now, it's changed with mm. the likes of Instagram, uh, the attention economy we live in. Where do you think, if you were to predict the changes over the next couple of years with what you've seen over the last, like, you know, 10, 20 years where back in the 1990s it would have been something like, a woman's desire for a man would be more, you know, you couldn't see social media. There was none of that. It was more if you went to the bar, you had a nice suit, you mm. looked good, he's probably an investment banker or something like that and she would go for there. Where now it's completely all online, uh, done within mere seconds. Where do you think this is going, the whole dating market, the whole attraction market, or is that too too hard to pick? Yeah, I mean, that's too hard. I mean... There, uh, Big question. I can't remember, just, I can't remember just... who said it, but there was there was a scientist recently who was who was asked a similar question on a completely different topic, yeah. and they said, you know, everyone's stumbling around in the dark, and maybe scientists can see up to six inches further, right? <laughs> so it's like there's not. I mean, what am I going to tell you that my guess is going to be almost as good as the next person, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, in terms of what's happening next. In yeah. terms of what's happening, though, you're right that that uh, there does seem to be an. Mm. It seems to lubricate the market in the sense that. Anyone can access anyone, at least among the people who participate in social media. Yep. There's this ability to access people, which is so you're right that it's it, it's definitely changed from at least our grandfathers where it's like, oh, you know, you either meet them physically or you never see them ever, ever again. So. Once they left, no pen pal, no nothing. No, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe a pen pal, but <laughs> there's they got the be address. Very, they, yeah. Yeah. But there'd be very little um, there'd be very little ability to introduce yourself to someone non-physically and it does seem that you know a lot of people are meeting online now mm. i mean it's not that most people are meeting on dating apps but it does seem that i mean there's some data to suggest that up to half of people are meeting online in general right well, just take the stigma of it it's changed completely yeah the stigma has reduced tremendously i mean when i was when dating apps first came out <coughs> for me i mean it was like it was kind of it was kind of embarrassing to be on them, yeah. if that makes sense. It's like, oh, well, why can't you meet someone in person? But that changed very quick. Someone in person, but that changed very quickly. Yeah. Then it became like a briefly quite cool, and now I think it's going around again. I, I kind of get this sense in the air that it's maybe a little bit of an embarrassing well, thing to yeah, do. Again. But it's not. But it's not. It's not gone back to that full blown like, what are you doing on there? I think, and most people are pretty open about it as well. Yeah. It's it's no longer something that people are 
um, secretive about. Like, it, like people will talk openly about being on Hinge or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's now there's memes, there's this, and I think memes do play a great part in our... Normalizing everything. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's always sure a do. hint of, like, if there's a joke, there's a hint yeah. of truth. If there's a meme, there's a hint yeah. of truth there. And also there's a hint of accept, uh, acceptability. I mean, you know, yeah. like, you well, it's, can... It's you a can, social thing that's being shared, so, yeah. like, I guess... You, yeah, you can spread something in a meme, and then suddenly, you know, it's totally acceptable to say, <laughs> but the meme itself, it, it kind of had to be funny to make that comment acceptable. It's almost like yeah. in today's generation, that's the only way to get the truth through. It's through jokes. A little bit, of, yeah. yeah the, com- what do they say? The, no. com- the comedians and the, the new politicians. And this oh, and that. interesting. Yeah. I they, mean, yeah. I don't know how good I'd be at uh, analyzing that sort of thing, but if, yeah. it, it's different. Let's yeah. just say. I think it's funny. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the other podcasts you went through, you were talking about specifically in in terms of the dating apps and how that availability has stopped us and and, and is more. It's allowing access to things that we didn't have access to where before it was more pair bonding was a lot easier. And now it seems like pair bonding has become a little bit more tricky. One of the things I I heard you talk about was that back in the day, it was easier to, it was harder to find someone, easier to keep someone. Interesting. I don't know that I have, I don't know that I have talked about that. And now it seems like it's completely flipped where... Um, because of this globalization, which I call the globalization of the sexual marketplace, where everyone has access to everyone, that it's now the opposite. It's easy to meet people, you know, mm. but it's harder to retain them because of this almost mass where a, a woman in, in a relationship can still get potential suitors 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I don't really know of any data on whether relationships are not as long as they used to be. Intuitively, that does, you know, that really does jive with me. That does seem correct. But I just don't, I just don't know. On, the, on, the, on, a, on a data perspective, it's hard to tell, I guess. Yeah, it's hard to tell. I mean, there's a lot of people who have this perception. There's a lot of people who have this perception that, oh my gosh, dating is just harder than ever. Mm. You know, the, the mating market has gotten so bad and it's like, Mate, when was it ever easy? I mean, for all of human history and mammalian history more generally, there's been a subset of males, right? A subset of male mammals. In some species, that it's the norm mm-hmm. that, you know, most males don't reproduce. In our species, that's not the norm, right? Mm-hmm. There have been periods of time where it seems that's been the case. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, I mean... The mate competition is the hardest competition. Mm. And so a lot of people, they're saying like, oh, you know, dating is harder than it's ever been. And it's like, but you've only dated in the present. How do you know? <laughs> How do you like compare it. it to the past? It's like, yeah, it's hard. Yes, yeah. it's very hard. Yeah. But I don't think it was ever easy. And, and I think that that's a strange expectation people have. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, there are probably some things that are more difficult and made more difficult by you know, these online technologies, but then there are also probably some things that are made easier, yeah. right? So mm-hmm. for example, from a globalization perspective, and, and I'm, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here, yeah, I really yeah. do understand these critiques of just the current um, dating perspective, but think about in terms of finding someone who's maximally compatible with you mm-hmm. emotionally, right? In a hunter-gatherer setting, right, which is where we spent most of human evolution. I mean, people often go back a hundred years, but why not, why not go further? Yeah. It's like most of human evolution. We were, we were in <coughs> these hunter gatherer groups, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. How many women would you know? How many, right? I mean, not yeah. that many. Yeah. No, right? not at all. How many women would you know who are in your age range? Not that many. Yeah. Right. How many women would you know that are in your age range and single? Right. Again, not that many. Yeah. And when you cut it down, cut it down, cut it down. What's the final tally of like, potential people that you could marry and reproduce with. It's probably a very low number. And the odds that they are, you know, in your upper echelon objectively in terms of compatibility, attraction, Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. I genuinely, I genuinely (laughs) don't know how good of a, I don't know how good of a situation that is, Mm -hmm. right? I'm in some ways quite grateful for the idea that it's like, you know, today you can have a really good shot at meeting someone who is genuinely up to your standards across multiple criteria instead mm. of just being, you know, the person who happened to be there. That's good. I like that. Yeah. If they could take that one away, that's good. Yeah. Because again, it's, it's always, uh, there's always going to be a bias within your mind. Yeah. That's what I feel with these guys. You know, if it was, oh, they'll come up with a, 
come up with an excuse, come up with a reason why, a rationalization of why it's so much harder for them or their country mm. or, um, you know, networking. You know, I can't do it in this country because of this reason. So they'll always come up. The human brain's always good at finding yeah. a reason why. It's so hard in yeah. this situation. And then also if dating apps are destroying the mating market, how many, what, what percentage of men and women are actually on dating apps? I don't have yeah. the statistics memorized, but it's... I, I would be surprised. I'm, I'm sure that I wouldn't be surprised if a huge portion of people have used them. Mm. But in terms of how, what percentage of men and women are actively using dating apps, I'm actually going to bet that it's, a, let's say, a substantial minority and that most people are probably still, you know, I mean, I, I genuinely don't know the data here. Maybe, yeah, maybe we yeah, can yeah. look it up at some point, but that's... Uh, I'd love to yeah, get, get a statistic because it, be it would be a very low number in terms yeah. of overall people. Yeah, and say. so it's like if you're the type... There, look, there is going to be a group of men who are going to struggle on mm. the dating apps. I mean, and there, there is going to be a group of men who are going to struggle on the dating apps and yeah. they're going to struggle online dating in general because there are some facets of it that aren't particularly favorable yeah. to certain males, right? I would say that facial attractiveness and height are both more important mm. substantially in an online context than they would be in an in-person context. I think you can actually, you can, you know, cut out people based on the the, yeah. the the settings. Yeah, I mean, that's what's so funny is that in a dating app setting, a woman can filter out all men below six foot. Mm -hmm. But in person, it's actually kind of hard to tell who is six foot, right? Like, it's actually kind of yeah, difficult. Yeah. Like, someone who's five foot ten, mm -hmm. if, I mean, if I see them just out and about, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily know from a distance or even up close, like how tall exactly is this person? Mm. Um, I mean, I, I would be able to say pretty confidently that they're not six foot two. But if they said <laughs> that they were six foot tall, I'd be like, well, maybe. I mean, they're a little shorter than me, but I can't tell for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Not gonna lie, a little bit different from my perspective. Like, yeah, I'm five seven, looking up at everybody. Oh, okay. So I'm like, yeah, I totally get what you mean, and that's that's kind yeah. of because everyone to me six yeah. foot. I'm like, oh yeah, what do you yeah. Give me an inch for. Yeah, I mean, I'm 6'1", and I see all these guys getting leg lengthening surgery, and I'm yeah, like... Yeah, that's a new trend, isn't it? Yeah, I'm like, geez, maybe I have to get that too now, just, six, to, six, three, just, six, to, just to maintain the advantage. I mean, this is this is height inflation. Yeah. It's going to be reducing the reducing the value of being tall. I, I don't think a huge proportion of men are going to do that, and I actually think it's kind of a sad thing. I mean, I, yeah. I do find all these intense body modifications kind of... I don't know. I, I feel bad for people who feel that they need to do that, but I also mm. understand where I also understand where they're coming from. Now, is this five seven? I wouldn't do it. Five, seven, <laughs> that's no, uh, it? Yeah, yeah, that's not I'm quite enough for me happy. to be like, you know what? I need to spend a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> and lose a yeah. Get yeah. two two things. Yeah. Excuse me. And the facial attractiveness <clears throat> is fine. So <laughs> not too bad. Well, it's good. Yeah. And it, well, one of the things that you know is is interesting. I always talk about these guys, and they're like, oh yeah, I got this problem or this, or you know, whether they're dating apps or their facial symmetry or the height mm. of this, and I'm like. I'm like, other than the surgeries, don't get me wrong, in, improve one other area. Yeah. Find so an true. area to, to, and so one of the, I always talk about the guys and, and I get a lot of flack online for this. I'm like, I was 5'7", I've always been 5'7", I've always been short, but that spurred me on to improve social skills. That's yep. in my voice. And I always say that uh, I don't have the luxury of being seen before I'm heard. So I have to reverse engineer that. So I have to be heard before I'm seen mm. because I, you know, literally on an angle, a girl wears heels. She can't see me. Yeah. So, so yeah. I always look at it as a, as, as a kind of a, a good thing. Mm. Every, every bad thing is a good thing. Getting onto this topic, which is really interesting. Have you seen, or you, you've become aware of the difference in mentalities between men as they grow through? So let me give you an example. I've noticed that in my life, I've reversed my idea of what trauma was. Started seeing it as a blessing. Hmm. Ever the worst things could happen to me, cancer, this, that, anything, anything, blessing in disguise. Is there, in your opinion, have you seen any sort of mindset stuff that has helped, or you've seen in in terms of any sort of mindset stuff that more dominant men? have that more submissive or more lower value men don't have. Interesting. I mean, I, I don't know if I would classify dominant versus submissive. That that that's an that's an interesting way of looking at I think I think, you know, there's there's definitely a status continuum and who succeeds along that hierarchy. There do, there do seem to be common patterns there. 
But the truth is, mate, it's just not it's just not my area of expertise. Mm, okay. And so anything yeah. I say, like if I say something about this, it, it, my answer is going to be as good as if you just picked out like a random guy on the street and, sure. and asked for his explanation. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I could, I mean, you know, there was a time when I would just answer anything. questions that yeah, I have yeah, no yeah, idea. Yeah. But the, the truth is that if this gets seen by, you know, hundreds of thousands of people yeah. and I'm just giving a nonsense answer that's based on, you know, my personal experience. It's like, all right, well, that's, that's useless. So hundred percent. No, no, yeah. I totally get that. And that's interesting because it's like, um, you will see online personalities say, say stuff like that. You yeah. will see them some more off the cuff and you also have to appreciate it, but also take it as a grain of salt. Yeah. I mean, said. it's just not, my, it's just not my role. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. if you look at, if you look at my content and what it's, and what it is, it's like the reason people come to me isn't because I have this, you know, incredibly charismatic personality mm. or something yeah, like that. Yeah, like yeah. that's that's really not what's happening. I'm not one of these guys who gets in front of the camera and there's just so much personality spilling off me that it's like, oh, it, you know, everyone wants to see that. Yeah. Not really. That's that's not what's happening. I, you know, sit in front of the camera very coldly and I just say interesting what research is. that I've read, analyzed, summarized, and put into something that someone with no academic background could understand. So that's what that's what people that's, that's what, what people do. come to me for. So your 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 research then that could be something that they could look they could take in. How would oh, you yeah. summarize like where would be the first thing that if you were like okay, say if that that was the you know that to- topic we were talking about dominant uh, mm. characteristics, how could someone, you know, take a bunch of the information online and then start to kind of sort through it? It's hard to know. I mean, if they, if they were interested in dominance specifically. Or, or any sort of subset of, of sort of status or mating strategies mm. or anything like that. Yeah. How, how, would yeah, you, yeah, yeah. how would you tell someone how to start understanding? How to start them? researching from a citizen science perspective, yeah, yeah, like just sure. like wanting to understand in, in it this objectively. Area. Well, it depends how, it depends what their background is. If they're, they're, they're going to be some, they're going to be some really interesting books written by experts Mm -hmm. for the public on any one of those topics. And if you can find one of those, that's kind of gold because it's like, you're going to get someone like David Buss, uh, who has, and that wouldn't be dominant specifically, but who's written a book where it's really aimed for someone who has no academic background, Uh but it's written by the most cited psychologist in his part of the field. Right. So it's like, Oh, this is everything in here is going to be at least mostly true Mm -hmm. and certainly true to, at least, at least it's going to be the best guess of many of the people in the field. Yep, so yep. it's going to be pretty good. Mm. And it's written for me, so I'm not going to misinterpret it. If, you know, you've got a little bit of an academic background, right? Maybe you studied hard in school and you want to approach this, you know, in a, in a more thorough research way. What I would do is I would try to find the authors who are publishing on that topic, right? So let's say you're interested in... Let's say you're interested in dominance, right? You, you just find that interesting. <coughs> I would be like, okay, well, who's writing about dominance in the academic mm-hmm. literature? And then I would try to, you know, read their top publications. Uh, there's plenty of ways to access academic journals. Yep. And um, yeah, so see how you get along. It, it, it's not that difficult. And mm-hmm. you'll certainly get, uh, even just reading the abstracts of some of the biggest publications and, you know, one of those, one of those you know, books aimed at the yep. public you'll be just miles and miles ahead of most of the people on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram who are just saying whatever opinion jumps into their mind on whatever given topic. And it, you know, has just, it just has no backing. It's, it's just, you know, whatever life they've happened to lead churned up and then spat out. So what, one of the things that I did see was the pushback on a lot of the red pill stuff. Now I wanted to make a little uh, question for you. Do you think mating strategies for the Western world differ to the Eastern world? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, it depends. I mean, there's, there's going to be huge cross-cultural variation in mating strategies and mm. there's going to be some things that, you know, remain the same, but yeah, I mean, there's huge, there's huge cultural difference. I mean, even East versus West yeah. is not, not even the type of distinction that I would make. I mean, you would have to kind of go cultural group by cultural group. So let's take a, a 25 year old American man yeah, versus a 25 year old uh vietnamese or chinese or, mm. or japanese man yeah oh, well i wouldn't know i mean i i really wouldn't know what those specific cultural groups but i would say that you know there's there's not that much variation in terms of what you can do just okay. from a mating strategy perspective mm-hmm. and you know you'll pick up your own cultural context and, uh, yeah. and try to make it work within it i mean there's going to be 
I, I think where this gets interesting is is you realize you know when you're when you're in a, a multicultural relationship, let's mm-hmm. say that's when you really understand like oh they just do things differently right okay. like the, yep. the the way things actually work mechanically are different mm-hmm. uh, I, I mean i could go into detail there but i think i'll, I think I'll actually yeah, do that it. it's yeah. a, it's interesting cuz i had a look and i was like there is because you have a look at the 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 red pill stuff the manosphere stuff and a lot of it is targeted to an american man yeah it is targeted to an american man that's what they're, yeah. they're looking the, at and sometimes it seems to be just targeted at an american man in miami like it wouldn't really be relevant to someone in a conservative christian community yeah in or the Midwest. Iowa for you know yeah, Middle, exactly. midwest yeah it, w- it wouldn't really make a lot of sense and then also it's targeted my feeling is that a lot of the red pill content mm-hmm. is targeted to men who just don't share my romantic ambitions i mean mm-hmm. long term i you know i want to get married have kids mm. have a loving supporting family and just have a you know wonderful Wonderful and hopefully permanent, at least permanent, you know, till death to us part, yeah, relationship sure. with a woman, right? That, that That's that's what I view as like, you know, that's what my parents did. That's what my parents' parents did. Mm. And, you know, every, everyone, at least everyone, I know that a lot of people have a hard time with this, but, you know, everyone in my broader family, it's gone really well for, and I've just seen excellent results. And so I think it's, I think it's going to be fine for me. Fantastic, and that's what yeah. I'm looking for. These guys, you almost never hear them talk about that. I mean, some of them will have pursued that ultimately. They'll kind of change their track in their like 30s, that sort of thing. And some of them, I mean, some of them are, are, you know, married with kids and that Mm. kind of thing. But for the most part, it seems that these guys want this sort of lifestyle that just, I mean, this is putting aside the factual errors they make. Mm -hmm. This is putting aside the things they say, which I find just horrendously misogynist. It's like, this is just... It's just unbelievable that people that people are saying this sorts of things. But putting putting even those two things aside, it's like you know, at a personal level, one mm-hmm. of the reasons they don't resonate with me is that I is that I actually have a different mating strategy. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to just, you know, be at the clubs and bars and be a playboy. That's yeah. That, that doesn't even sound mm-hmm. I mean, maybe they maybe they wouldn't even believe me saying this, but that doesn't even sound fun. That just sounds uh the the, the strategies are changing recently. Yeah. And their the, strategies. Yeah, their strategies are. Exactly. Well, you're seeing more God God pill. It's a new thing that's come up where a lot more of the men are preaching. Yeah, I don't know if you're on Twitter. I, I assumed you were. I looked at your mm. Twitter stuff. Um, they're pushing more that idea of the traditional values of going back, having a family, you know, uh, being fundamentally very religious, uh, setting up their lifestyle where it's away from the hedonism, away from all that, all of that sort mm. of stuff. So you're, you're seeing little resurgence in the community already starting. That's think- interesting. I mean, I wish them luck with that. But mm. I also feel that coming at that sort of lifestyle with the sort of personalities that these guys tend to have, yeah. I, 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 I don't... A lot of the personalities, they're not like the Red Pill. They're completely different. It's a whole different like, okay. section. But yeah. they, they, they might have been the guys that delved into it and then offset it themselves. Then, yeah, I found out that they wanted something deeper. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's I mean that's the other thing, though, is that I don't... I, you know, I know people who are kind of permanently... In the, that, that's the other thing, is that that's not my main... Just to be clear, mm. that's really not my gripe with the Red Pill guys. Again, yeah. it's really factual errors yeah. and then statements that I just, I just view as horrifically sexist. Sure. Right? The mating strategies thing, I mean, it's totally possible to be, you know, an ethical polyamorous person who's mm. or, or or some version of that. I, well, as long as it's all consenting adults involved, I, I, I don't see how it's even my business. I'm just saying that personally, the sort of, From you your, know, yeah. the sort of advice that they would give to people, I'm like, well, you know, picking up girls isn't that hard. Uh, I'm more interested in like, how do I have a multi-year loving, supportive relationship mm. where you don't hate each other? Right. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, and yeah. that's a little more challenging and they're not the sort of guys who would be qualified to give advice on that. Definitely. Yeah. How does your science relate to your relationships? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, a lot, to yeah. be honest. It's, um, it's kind of funny. What, what are some of the main things that you find that you could see someone in that similar situation not having the, the wealth of knowledge mm. that you have and you understanding a lot of the things where you're like, oh, you can read through the situation from that more scientific yeah. lens. Well, maybe this is maybe this is revealing kind of a negative side of my personality, but I'm perhaps overly logical in some mm-hmm. ways, right? And so when I read some study that's, you know, very clearly laying out like, oh, you know, it's desirable and positive for men to do this sort of thing, mm-hmm. right? Oh, that's very compelling. I'm like, oh, that's hard evidence that this is a good thing to do. I'm, I'm doing let that. me let me let me go and do that. Yeah, okay. right. That that just works on me. Yeah, and, yeah. and so you know, it's it's. Is that, this, that would would that be so like a like an example of that? Would be the boxing? Would you say? 
Uh, no, boxing I, boxing I did for fun, mate. Okay. That was when I was... I started boxing when I was... Uh, before I was a teenager. Yeah, I, I, was, I was in boxing gloves um, before I hit puberty. Okay. I mean, I was... Uh, that's... I didn't. I didn't really. I just. I just loved to fight growing up, and that was the only that way to do it. Thing, right? yeah. like that's, so uh, you know, it kept me out of trouble. But that that didn't really. That, uh, that didn't. That what that wasn't. That wasn't for girls. That's, yeah, I mean, no, maybe no. maybe at some. I mean, you know what? Actually, from a from an evolutionary perspective, I would say that a huge part of the reason why men love to compete vigorously mm-hmm. is overmates, and so the impulses that I felt of like, oh, I want to, you know, uh, I want to get in a fight in public with yeah. tons of people watching. In a boxing ring, <laughs> and um, there was a little, little yeah, bit that was probably you. the reason that I felt that that was fun mm-hmm. was probably you know the same reason that two gorillas squaring off feel that at some level it's like this is fun. That yeah, I'm yeah, squaring yeah. off right now. Uh, I mean, maybe they don't feel that way. Maybe it's just incredibly stressful. But that's that's kind of what I'm psychologizing here. I mean, I'm really over my skis now, and this is going to be clipped, and I'm going to sound like a maniac. No, no, but no. but um, yeah, maybe at some subconscious evolutionary level. The reason that I enjoyed fighting when I was a teenager mm. is because of some mate competition lens, but that's not why. That's I would. That's I know. obviously not why. But it's the sort of things that I've that I've done just from a you know like deliberate mating mm-hmm. perspective. I mean, some of them are are pretty are pretty basic. It's like oh, like basic looks maxing stuff. Mm-hmm. Like how do you actually look better? Um, yeah. You know that's. That's that you know. There's actually quite a lot of research on well, that. Well, this is what this new thing is, basically. You know, what you see, it was kids hitting at themselves with a hammer. Oh, I mean, that, that, I would never do that. No, sort no, of thing. no, no. I would never do but that. But in sort terms of, of like, uh, if, if the guys were like, "All right, I want to become a little bit more attractive mm. in my looks," other than their height, they can't fix their height. Well, yeah. there's, there's, there's certain things. I, I do dead hangs a lot. Dead hangs yeah. definitely do decompress the spine a lot. Give you a little bit of a sense yeah. of a, a perk up. Your posture yeah. is another one. Um, I remember Big Sean back in the day, the the recording artist. He uh, went to the chiropractor and said he grew two inches. Oh wow! Because the chiropractor, yeah. you know, he had compressed discs, and that was that's a bit... interesting. I'm sure that I'm sure that in some cases that can that can that can definitely happen. Have a few different uh, things. But... What can someone? What can a uh, a young man now? You know, he might be say twenty. Mm. You know, he's... the first thing obviously is going to have to be the gym of some sort. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a thing. I would say the first thing, a lot of these men are just unhygienic, right? Okay. They, they, don't, Hygiene. Yeah. they don't smell good. Their hair and facial hair is not, you know, adequately trimmed and prepared. Yeah. You know, their nails are dirty. Mm-hmm. Um, they've, you know, they don't even know what teeth whitening is. They've just have, you know, years and years of coffee stains just, and I know that everyone's zooming in now on, yeah, um, yeah, on my yeah, teeth. Yeah. That they're not particularly white. I'm not like completely, I'm not a competitive maniac about just trying to look good. But in terms of like all the things that you can do, mm-hmm. I would say that the, the most bang for your buck in terms of like one day of work is like, okay, got to find a sick barber, someone who can okay. actually cut my hair, can do a good job good. and get that done. Right. Got to be a hundred percent clean, well-groomed mm-hmm. all over. Right. That that's a hundred percent the case. Getting clothes that are clean, fit, and match, right? Just, yep. just these are basic things that can be done in hours. And I would say, you know, if you if you want a little bit of extra height, nice pair of boots, yep. right? Mm-hmm. Some sneakers that have a little bit of a boost. I mean, you know, I'm I'm, I'm trying to look like I'm six four all the time, mm. right, ideally. So that so I, so I mean, as tall I, as possible. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So looking at looking a little bit taller, that's that, that, that's that's going to help, mm-hmm. and that can all be done in one day. After that, you know, yeah, you definitely want to hit the gym, but then you also want to hit the gym in a way that's actually going to increase your attractiveness if that's why you're doing it, Mm -hmm. right? And so focusing on muscles that expands the shoulder to hip ratio, right? So broadening up here, right? You know, spamming lateral raises, that sort of thing. Um, Getting this area wider and broader um, relative to your waist. So, you know, losing weight if that's the problem Huge, yeah. gaining weight up here if that's the problem but you want to expand that ratio because the you know the ideal I, I believe the ideal is something like 1.6 which is quite quite large for um, the guys for the guys watching i was uh the swimmer's body yeah it's just yeah. the ideal hip yeah. ratio yeah but the, but a lot of this is going to be genetic mm-hmm. unfortunately but some of it is going to be pretty manipulable just by hitting the gym I'm not saying that I do all these things, right? I'm not saying that I put huge effort into my appearance, but it is the case that you can improve your appearance physically, Mm. uh, doing some basic things. And they're all, 
relatively supported by uh, my research. We talked about a few people even that don't have uh, symmetrical faces, which is your Ryan Gosling doesn't, your Tom yeah. Cruise, you know, yeah. if, you, if you go into. So so some people are lacking in certain... That's the other thing is that we yeah. talk about hard features that are... Fa- that a lot of people are, do research on like what makes faces physically attractive. Mm. And the truth is, is that, yeah, it's things like symmetry. It's things like averages. Uh, for, whether you're a man or a woman, it's it's different cues. Like it does seem that in women, cues to facial femininity, which yeah. is defined as not masculinity, yeah, basically, yeah, in yeah, terms yeah. of like how that structure is brought out, which is kind of funny. The um, and the masculinity the same for femininity. But mm-hmm. you know there are there are all these features, and then at the end of the day, you can find celebrities who are considered incredibly desirable who don't have most of those things. Yeah. So clearly there's a little bit of a magic to there there are there is high integrator agreement mm-hmm. but on what faces are attractive. So I'm not saying it's socially constructed or something like that. It partially is. Mm-hmm. But um, you know there's high integrator agreement on what faces are attractive, but at the end of the day there's a little bit of magic there that's kind of hard to define. It's like, yeah, that guy is clearly handsome and nobody can really put a technical reason as to why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get you. Do we know why humans differ in what they find attractive? So Yeah, some in some cases, yeah. yeah. So one great example of this is actually BMI. Okay. Right? So in the West and in some places like Japan and, and other relatively affluent places, you see this strong preference for women of lighter BMIs, mm-hmm. right? But this isn't... Uh, this isn't an evolved cultural universal. And this is one of the things that first got me into evolutionary psychology and human behavioral ecology and these fields that actually look into it. Mm -hmm. And what we see that, you know, in a place like Japan, maybe a BMI of 18 would be preferable. Right. But, you know, in in certain parts of the Caribbean, Mm -hmm. right. Um, Or, you know, among perhaps the South African Zulu right there, there are certain, there are certain groups where BMIs of, past 30 are considered quite attractive, mm-hmm. right? And that, that's a huge range just for people yeah. who aren't familiar with, you know, BMI. 18 is underweight, definitely. Like that, you would look at that person and be like, oh, that's a very, very small human being. And 30, I mean, that's, that's where we get into the definition of obesity. Now, BMI isn't a perfect measurement tool, right? It's certainly not a perfect proxy for health. But it is a direct measurement of how big you are relative to your height, right? Mm-hmm. It's literally kilograms per meter squared. And we see this variation in what people find attractive. And that variation mm. seems to come down partially to r- responses to levels of resources in the environment. Okay. So some cultural variation yeah. in what humans find attractive is actually undergirded by ecological variation. So okay. if you're in, think about this just from a strategic game theory perspective. If you're in, if you're a man in an area where resources are abundant, mm-hmm. then sure, maybe thinness is a cue to lack of certain diseases, right? Maybe it's a cue to metabolic health. It's certainly a cue to status in many of these groups, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're in a place where resources are scarce, well, then having a little extra weight on your body suddenly becomes quite impressive. It's a sign that they have resources. It's a sign that they have access to resources. It's a sign that in times of instability, they'll actually be able to get through it, right? Mm-hmm. If there's a famine, yeah, they'll yeah. be able to survive. And also fertility declines precipitously during periods of starvation, mm. right? So this is someone who's going to still be fertile even during those periods. And this isn't just cross-cultural. Right. We also see it at the individual level yeah. in some very clever studies where, for example, they took, they took university students and measured their BMI preferences, male university students, and measured their BMI preferences before and after dinner. And before dinner, the men preferred heavier women. Right? So there's this idea in you know, an, an American context or in an Australian context where it's like, oh, you know, all men want thin women. And it's like, not really. That's, that's very ecologically sensitive as a preference. And we do see that, you know, wealthier men might want thinner women. But men who grew up in a resource-scarce environment or a resource or an unstable environment, or they're in an environment where resources aren't as reliable, or they as an individual are in a period of acute stress, right, resource-wise. Again, mm-hmm. I'm saying the word resources over mm-hmm. and over again. But 
these types of men, their preferences will shift towards heavier women. So, and it that makes sense make from sense. an evolutionary perspective. So that's just one example. I mean, we could we talk just go about through, even going through history, you know, 1700s, 1600s. And there are world. historical studies as yeah. well, where, for example, there's been studies on, I mean, it's kind of goofy, but yeah. it is compelling studies on playboy centerfolds in America okay. and tracking those with the economic cycles. And when the economy is strong, they get lighter. And when the economy is weak, they get heavier. So men's wow. preferences for desirability, even within a culture, right? And you yeah. know, within a culture, there's you don't expect that much variation over time. We see this consistent ecological variation. That's fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. So there are many things like that. Yeah. It's fascinating how every every person will interpret that differently. I interpret that as like a, a scarcity versus abundant mindset and how that would affect the the behaviors of the man and what they like, you know, if there's a lack of the, if they're in a lack of then they'll try to get their hands on anything they can. Oh, that no, skin. that's not it. Because And the reason that's not uh, sorry to no, uh, no, completely contradict you, but it's just that w w the, the way this study is, it's, I know that and this this kind of reveals the... Um, sorry, the I was no, kind no, of rude no, 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 no. But it reveals, forth, yeah. the, it reveals the bias that you're coming from as an Australian, okay. right? Where you're thinking thin, good, heavy, bad, right? Sure. But in some cultural contexts, mm -hmm. it really is thin, bad, it's not lowering okay. standards. It's literally like you show men a grid of, okay, which, which women do you think are the most attractive from this set? And they're pointing and they're saying, that they, you know, yeah, they're saying that one. And it's one who's way over on the BMI on scale is, towards a heavier context. Is that because of like uh, the five monkey test where they put the monkeys in the, the ladder and the, the bananas and they wet the monkeys every time the banana went out? Would that be because their fathers like that, their fathers like that, their fathers like that and it was being brought like sort of passed down? It goes to the ecological thing where it's like they're okay. in a resource scarce environment. Uh -huh. And so their, their evolved psychology is responding to the ecological cues. Okay. It's saying, oh my God, we're, you know, we're in a terrible period of famine right now. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, you know, I can't be sure that we're going to have food next week. Which women are the most attractive? The women with the, the women who are reason. bigger. Yes. Right? The bigger women are more attractive because yeah. they're the ones who are going to survive. They're the ones who are going to be fertile. So it's definitely not. And they're a, just status signals. It's not, is, a, it's not a status signal. It's a, it's a mechanical signal to that woman's reproducibility. Okay. Right? So it's okay. literally, I might not have food next week. Who do I want to be my mate? Well, the obviously the one who has food, clearly. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas in, you know, in an Australian context where, you know, I mean, I'm not speaking about everyone. Obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. there are people who are, who are dealing with resource bit. insecurity here. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, it's going to be like, I'm not worried about whether I have food next week, mm. right? And so your, uh, your evolved psychology is more responding to, oh, this is, you know, a place of abundance. Mm -hmm. Everything's going pretty well. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't need to worry too much about that. So I want to go for what's a cue to health in my specific environment. So it's, so it's, not, it's not getting their hands on whatever they can get, as you say. It really is a shift in ideal. So okay. the ideal becomes heavier the in response to the environment. The yeah. desire of like yeah. what it is. Okay. And you I genuinely apologize no, if, no, I, came off as, if no. I came off as rude there. No, no. But but this is this is a very well researched area. In any sort of any sort of debate, I'm, I'm very open for because yeah. I like to see the different, as I said, different opinions, different ideas, and to yeah. see that, you know, yeah, there could have been cognitive biases through the place I live, in the, very, the, the people I listen to. Obviously, that's going to have a huge. But also, you huge, know, you're you're a, you're a, even from an ecological perspective, not yeah. even just cultural. It's like you're a wealthy guy, and so. You know, you're, you're going to probably be like the average wealthy guy and have yeah. certain preferences. But, you know, for those of us who maybe were or are in a period of acute instability mm -hmm. or, or have been in an uh, uh, unstable environment or come from a culture that's chronically unstable from a resource perspective, they're going to have heavier preferences. They're going to have heavier yeah. preferences. Yeah, I like it. I yeah. like it. Let's get on the topic we wanted to discuss, which was the situation that happened recently on Twitter. You saw people everywhere, which is the idea of uh, the Dylan Dennis versus Logan Paul situation which we wanted to cover oh yeah it's a, it's a it's an interesting thing and, and I, I want to take it from my perspective too because I, mm. I i consume it from different sides and i like to see everything from a from a an evolutionary side i would like to see i'm not supposed to touch these from an evolutionary know, I've side been moving, yeah. i've been moving these around like like it's a jigsaw puzzle let me just yeah. rearrange that i'm so sorry no you're fine um from a, from an evolutionary perspective uh, from, from my perspective, sorry, I saw that this was a – it's a fight to it's start fight. with. Yeah, it's a fight. I've, I've seen a lot worse things been done over the years, yeah. 100%. But it's interesting. I'd love to get your perspective, not from a more, you know, who's right, who's wrong, but more mm. from like what was the, the, the backlash and everything that's, that's come 
you know, as a, as a, as a part of it. Yeah. I mean, I, at a personal level, I think it's just incredibly cruel and I'm, I'm not a fan at all, mm. but I don't think anyone cares what, <laughs> what I think on sure, that. Like, sure. it's more like, you're right that it's more interesting to look at it from a human mating behavior perspective. Yeah. Logan Paul, big YouTuber, uh, big entertainer, big, yep. big No one knows who he is. No, no, so no. let's just make sure I mean, that. So he actually is like, you know, yeah. um, and you got Dylan Danis, who was Conor McGregor's uh, jiu-jitsu partner mm. um, all through the, the fights from your, your Jose Aldo's to your Nate Diaz's. He's been someone that's been in Conor's camp for a long time. He started to make a name for himself, started to come out and, and box and, and do all his stuff uh, after a, a knee surgery. And, he was first supposed to fight Logan Paul and now they went back and forth to hype the fight up and it came to the point where Dylan Dana started tweeting uh, material on Logan Paul, Paul's new fiancé. Photos with, uh, with her and Lena DiCaprio, photos with her and, and a lot of men in Hollywood, a lot of distinguished men that, you know, I, I'm, I was well aware of and I know. Mm. Uh, and he's, he's used it as a tactic to, as a psychological warfare pretty yeah. well. Yeah, it seems like it's psychological warfare. It also seems like it's probably promoting the fight. Mm -hmm. Oh, it definitely is. Yeah, yeah. 100%. I mean, we're talking about it right now, so it's clearly having some effect there. And so I can't really speak to Dylan Danis's intention. I also just don't know him at all. Well, yeah. So it's entirely possible that he himself is solely just interested in promoting the fight. Like mm -hmm. that could be just his only goal. And if that's his only goal, it does seem to be working. Again. I, I don't support this behavior, sure. but uh, I, I understand that maybe from an economic perspective, it's, it's, uh, it's a, you know, a lucrative decision to make. I'm more interested in it from a human mating behavior exactly. perspective. Yes. And my first thought looking at this is that it looks like intrasexual competition, not from Dylan himself, mm -hmm. but maybe the people who are following Dylan, who are getting really energized by this, mm -hmm. who are just loving seeing Logan Paul and his fiance be humiliated mm. a lot of these guys who are saying things like oh i would never wife up nina agdal they i mean i i don't know how to say this in a in a, in a nice way but 99 point i think it's fair to say that 99.9% .9 <laughs> of them have a would never have a shot with anyone even remotely as attractive mm -hmm. as as that person right and many of them maybe not most but many of them will never have an attractive woman desire them, mm. right? And that's that's a very painful spot for them to be in. Oh, yeah. And so this is an opportunity for them to, you know, dunk on one of these very attractive women who would mm. never desire them mm -hmm. and also, you know, dunk on a male competitor who would, I mean, in, say what you will about Logan Paul, but he's probably richer than you, could probably beat you up, right? Like all these, like the yeah. list of things that men want to have on each other. Mm. He probably has them on you specifically, right? Not you, but the, the, people, the people who are commenting this, the, the you know, the Dylan Dennis uh, supporters. And what it reminds me of is a conversation I had with Alexander from uh, datepsychology.com, yep. uh, which he kind of called a, which he called a sour grapes, which he called sour grapes intrasexual competition. A fox can't reach the grapes, and so he says they're too sour, right? A man can't sleep with a woman or can't date a woman or can't marry a woman, and so he claims he wouldn't want to anyway. Mm. And so for a lot of these guys, they're saying like, oh, I, I would never marry someone like Nina Agdal. And it's like, okay, send me a text when you get the opportunity to yeah. marry someone with Nina Agdal. We'll get on the phone and, and have a conversation about whether that's a good decision. Yeah. But until then, why, why, why are you even posting? It, it's, uh, you know, it's like it falls a little flat mm -hmm. to say I would never marry someone like that when someone like that would just never even look at you. Yes, for sure, for sure yeah. 100%. I think it's interesting uh, to look at it from, you know, the perspective of the 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 respect angle that he mm. went at, which is a loss of respect from a lot of people on a certain character based on what his spouse has done before him. But it's, he's losing respect from people that most people don't respect, wouldn't, if that makes respect. sense. It's like, and, and the other thing, I'll just say, like mm. these, are, these are not... Like sometimes I see these posts and I'm like, oh gosh, this is horrible. And then I remember I'm like, oh, these are all coming from, you know, those people who were impossible to talk to mm -hmm. in high school and then, yep. you know, didn't really do anything with their lives. And now they're on Twitter. Like everyone with like a good paying job is not on Twitter yeah, dunking sure. on Logan Paul's fiance. So these shits. are like, this, so this is like the, the, 
you know, the least, and, and again, I'm not even saying thing, anything about Dylan Dennis specifically. Mm, mm, as a I think it's, yeah. And also I'm not even saying that he's engaging in intrasexual competition. Mm. I think it's entirely possible that he is literally just promoting the fight in like a really cold way. Mm. And also the Paul brothers, it's not like they haven't, Done you know, crossed shit. lines in the all, past. All themselves, he's yeah. yeah, it's like he's definitely taking it further, mm. but they've taken it. They've been the ones taking it further this entire time, yeah, right? Yeah, they've yeah. always been the ones pushing the pushing the envelope. So, so you know, it's hard to know how much to how much to feel bad for anyone involved. I do feel bad for Nina. It seems really unfair because I mean, she's a thirty year old woman. They're mm. all going to have you know a dating history. And whether it was so, whether it's real or not, it mm. seems like a really brutal thing to do. To just, I mean, this is someone who wasn't particularly famous before and is now suddenly super, super famous, famous for something that you know has socially negative connotations. And then it also, and maybe I don't know if you have a take on this, and maybe everyone disagrees with me. Mm. I, mean, I haven't paid super close attention to the situation, but I did scroll through Dylan's Twitter, and it kind of, <clears throat> it kind of comes across as just fake. Right, like it's like some of these are definitely photos with their exes, mm -hmm. but then a lot of these are photos with fans. Yep, a lot of yep, them are yep. modeling shoots, and a lot of them are photoshopped. Mm. And if you take out all of those, then it's just her with like three different ex boyfriends, mm. and it's like that's you know that's a very normal dating history, in fact. And so it's kind of hard to see what the fuss is all about. And and I you know I kind of I kind of don't think it's. I guess I just kind of don't think it's real. It seems like sure, a made up yeah. thing for a story. Mm -hmm. But even if it is real, what a horrible thing. I mean, who cares if, um, I just, I just feel like who cares if someone has, you know, a colorful romantic history, everyone you know should be able to do what they want in that respect. And it seems, um, there is this it, paradox definitely that's starting to emerge in the whole space. Yeah. It seems, it seems just really, um, it seems just really, you know, seems really cruel. But hey, it was fight game. I, I guess it is in the fight game, and there, there is no holes bar. Yeah, I mean there. Yeah, I mean there. It, it's certainly worse things have been said. I know you know Tyson was saying that he wants to. Uh, I think he said that he wanted to kill someone's children or eat someone's children. Yeah. He said something. Please don't sue me, but he, no. he said something like that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so people have said crazy things. This does feel. I guess the only reason it feels different is because it's so repetitive and long term. Like this has now been. This has now been months leading up to yeah. the fight. And it, so if it was like one tweet with Le with his ex and Leonardo mm. DiCaprio, that's kind of goofy, blows over in a day. But instead it's like going to the effort of finding as much content as possible and sharing it daily. I don't know. It seems really horrible. At, at one point, I think the very first couple were very interesting in terms of it did expose. I, I think the, the worst part of it is the video. And this is where it comes into my realm where it was the the proposal and, and this and all the things that led up to with, with with Logan. And then it was the subtle fraudulent slips that were happening throughout all, all of it. Uh, one of them is um, uh, when he proposed to her, uh, the fraudulent slip was I'm, I'm engaged mm. and he calls her out and says we're engaged. That was interesting. Sort of little real micro nuances in the language that was being said. So I think they painted a, a bit more of a, a picture in terms of uh, like a like a like a narrative of that she she might be using him, she, yeah, and all maybe in all these kind of things, and that's what they've tried to, and that I think that's what fed into a lot of it all at the same time yeah. too. So but it's it, also so hard to know what people are like when they're alone. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's true. like mm. you know, Logan Paul's a very famous person. Nina is now also a very famous person, mm. and so everything that they show to the public is going to be. There's going to be what they show to the public, which is going to be highly strategic and chosen and sometimes even chosen for deliberate drama, right? Yep, like, yeah, like yeah. it's not like, I mean, if one mm. thing about the Palm brothers is that they do seem to deliberately try to attract hate and dislike yeah, in attention. order to make money. Yeah. And so I wouldn't be surprised if anything like that is just like, yes. well, this is just trying to cook up a little story, yeah, but yeah. at home... At home, it could be Camelot, it could be hell. We just have no idea. Yeah. And again, this is another thing is that I kind of feel, I, I almost feel bad even talking about, I don't think I've said anything negative about anyone involved. Sure. Um, I guess I've said negative things about the people who are sharing the Dylan Dennis content, but it really is, it's negative, but it's 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 meant in good faith. Like I really- It's, it's an interesting situation. Yeah, it's it's an interesting situation. I don't, I don't have any ill will towards anyone involved. Mm. And it's, um, but I, I, I do think, I do think that, 
you know, I guess I guess in in boxing everything is fair game, but you know, and you're not boxing, you're not boxing this woman. Yeah. I mean, you're boxing Logan Paul, so maybe yeah. focus more on him and less on um and less on this you know this random. Woman. It'd, be, it'd be interesting. Love to get your takes on something that I do from your perspective. Yeah. So I have I created a um a system called the Seven Pillars of Status. I noticed when I was uh, teaching a lot of my men that, uh, and it'd be interesting to get yourself, if you ask a man what he rates himself, he usually says the average is seven. Mm. That's what, you know, I think everyone, everyone thinks that's the social, yeah. well, as you, well, you called it an interesting name where it's socially acceptable to say this number too high, it's not, yeah. and you start to like lower your status in that. Anyways, so uh, in 2020, me and my friends sat down and realized that the way that men ranked themselves was the way that they deemed or well, they saw attractiveness within women which was mainly looks. Mm. And so when they're looking at themselves like, oh, I'm this built, I'm this, they weren't taking a deeper lens, like a, like a, a more in-depth uh, lens on it. So I sat down and came up with seven p- pillars. And those seven pillars were how women deemed men as attractive. And you just want to run these by me and get yeah, kind I'd of love to get your, your take on it. Yeah, yeah, so that's, so that's fine. Lot, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with a lot of the the hor- I mean, here's the other thing that yeah. I'll just say up front is that you know I'm familiar with the mate attraction literature yeah. and the mate preferences literature, but sometimes something can be true without it being encapsulated by that. Okay. I just won't be able to say on, on it. Yeah, no, I'd love to get yeah. your take on it because the seven pills we run through is um, so you got looks. Is number one, or no, not no particular order. Social media, you got social proof, which is pre-selection, and your social network, mm. which is in there. Um, you've got your naturalness, so your ability, your masculinity, your natural vibe. Uh, you have your logistics, so where you are located in the world. Mm. Uh, you've got your uh, game, so your ability to be able to attract and and talk to different people. And then the last one is your financial freedom. Mm. They were the seven pillars that we crafted. And and what what I do for a lot of the guys is then I give them, I, I get them to rate themselves in each pillar, come up with a number and that's their actual pillar. Yeah. That's what their actual score is. And what I found was that a lot of the guys would rank themselves as seven, would do the test. What do you rank yourself? Seven. Oh, I'm a 7.2. And they'd come back and it would be at 3.85. Yeah. Or it'd be a two. Yeah. And I'm like, that's your number. Yeah. So the way that I looked at this was how to increase their attractiveness was to get their point higher. And uh, what we noticed was hypergamy had a lot to do with this. As soon as they'd improve their, their overall ranking as a man, they would start to de- get the attractiveness or the attraction or start to get some signals from more attractive girls. Yeah. In that whole thing, is that, do you see a flaw in that sort of system? No, what not do you really. Ta- what do you no. take it from I, there? I mean, I think that that sounds... I mean, I don't know the details, but mm-hmm. in terms of the components that are helpful when dating, that's certainly a lot of them. Mm-hmm. I guess one area that would be useful to improve that's not necessarily talked about in these spaces a lot is just mental health. Okay. I mean, a lot of these guys who are struggling with women, I don't even know if I should say this, but just from the outside, it seems like they have, they have some kind of personality disorder okay. or mental health yeah. issues. Mm-hmm. If you look at studies on men who struggle with women acutely, you know, they, the, the rates of mental health issues is just astounding. And so that would be another area where it's like, if you're unstable mm. as a person and irrational or, you know, cruel and psychopathic or, you know, just all the, all these different things, yeah, it's going to, it's going to hurt you. But if you're only interested from just a mating success perspective, if that's the only thing that motivates you, that's going to be a huge component that doesn't seem, that doesn't seem covered. But you know, the other things, it's like, yeah, obviously, making more money, yeah. that's going to make you more attractive. Mm-hmm. Looking better, that's going to make you more attractive. I, I believe you said naturalness and game. Na- naturalness. I'm assuming you just mean like general social competence, like being able to be a friendly and fun person to be around. Yes, nat- naturalness was um, mainly your ability to handle stress. Okay, so that actually does encapsulate a lot of, a the, lot of, the, a lot of the mental health stuff. Yeah, right. you don't want to be... Uh, I'm, and I say this, I say this with a lot of sympathy yeah. as I, you know, I've had struggles with, um, with mental health issues myself and it's, and, and like real mental health issues. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, yeah, you don't want to be delusional or mm-hmm. anxiety ridden or yeah. depressed. Like those traits, those, those traits can hold you back. I will just make one note yeah. on just how <laughs> a lot of the other traits seem to change how negative traits get filtered. Okay. I mean, if you're, 
you know, if you're a depressed, hot guy, you might come across as moody and mysterious. But if you're a depressed, ugly guy, then you're just no fun to be around, you know? <laughs> so there are, there are some ways in which, you know, things get filtered. But I, I, would, say that's, um, I would say that's mostly good. And if you're encapsulating, uh, I, I, think that all, I think that all sounds you know, like sense. it would be very helpful to, to a man's mating success. Becoming richer, becoming handsomer, <coughs> and becoming more pleasant to be around. Yeah, social but, media's in there. Oh, yeah, social media yeah. as well. I mean, I guess today, yeah, especially if you're dating online, I mean, gosh, I, I, I would be sure that I would be sure that every date I've ever been on, it's you know, it, there's been a there's been at least a search, you know, some um, some sort of thing there. Yeah, I would say that I would say that that's that's very <coughs> likely. You also said most people, men and women, haven't haven't maxed out their own physical attractiveness. No, no, of course not. I, I think it'd be very hard to. Okay, because there's so much you can do. In terms of, it'd be interesting to see. Um, what are the big levers other than we've, we've talked about it a little bit. We've talked about, as you said before, what are the things? Yeah. So yeah, I did mention some things, but we can go, you can go back. Yeah. Into it, yeah. yeah a little bit deeper because again, a lot of people, they de you know, again, as I just said with the, this is what we deemed a lot of guys, they think so uh, binary linear, like, Oh, I must get more attractive physically. And that's the only yeah. metric. There are so many more other metrics, but mm. this one I, I feel is something that they, they just hamper on a lot. Yeah, that's true. Because I guess it is is—it is something that in, in everything that you're doing, well, a, a great example, I, I tell people, I'm like, your social media is important, number one, because you're asleep for eight hours. Someone wants to look up who you are. They go on your Instagram, they see. Yep. So that's your 24-hour personality live yep. right now. you know. But that also does with looks, your financial freedom, sometimes more attractiveness. You get, you know, you know, let's take sales or something like that. Yep. There's a lot of data out there that says more attractiveness, the better for you know uh face-to-face -face sales you are so on their physical attractiveness uh men and women i'd like to know exactly what what uh what are some key levers that people don't think about that they could uh, key yeah. levers that people don't think about is tough because i think most people know vaguely what they would have to do yeah but again it's i would say uh, i mean women don't seem to have as much of a problem with this but i would say with men being you know Super clean and hygienic, yeah. uh, well styled, well groomed. Mm -hmm. The same. Uh, very, get, very you know, same. getting haircuts more frequently <laughs> would yeah, help yeah, a lot yeah. of guys. Even if your barber is not that good, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's it's incredible how much better most men look. Mm -hmm. You know, the three days after they got their haircut. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you know, haircuts aren't that expensive. You can you can get them <laughs> to a few you can get them more frequently. Um, but the big one that everyone kind of already knows about is the gym. I mean, that's. Mm -hmm. That's you don't just change your physical attractiveness by hitting the gym. You also are likely going to change your facial attractiveness. Yeah. Not as significantly, uh -huh. but if you look at people who work out a lot, they tend to have you know more neck muscularity. You, you strain your neck in a lot of exercises, yeah, even if yeah. you're not working it out deliberately. Uh, they, they tend to. But there's know, that new thing with have the, a better with the framing neck. of the face, even with 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 you know the shoulders. Yeah. Um. There there might be some kind of broad all over muscular development. Mm -hmm. There's some really interesting anecdotal cases of people like only training arms and gaining muscle all over their body. Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. possible that there's some <laughs> facial development as well. But then the main thing is that your body composition changes. Right. You mm -hmm. you have more muscular relative to fat, and that means your face is going to be leaner. And it's not always mm. the case. You can certainly go too lean there. Yeah. Like you don't want to look. Um, I mean, when I was trying to make weight for <coughs> boxing, I looked like Skeletor. I was, I was yeah. just uh, terrifying. And that that probably wasn't you know maximally attractive. Yeah. But for yeah. most people, you know, a little less weight on the face probably probably would help. Would help. And um, yeah, uh, I I don't know. I don't think I'm gonna. Say, that's the thing yeah, is that I don't think I'm gonna say anything. If there was an incredible trick that you, I could give people to get more attractive they would probably use it. Yeah. There's a very long list of little things you can do mm. that added together. If you did all of them, yeah, you could get substantially. A lot better. Yeah. Yeah, you could get a lot better. I mean, and, and a lot of people already know this because it's like, think about how you look for a date mm. with someone who you really like versus how you look first thing in the morning. It's like what happened in between point A and point <laughs> yeah. B. It's like you did a lot of things, yeah. right? Yeah. So you, you mechanically made a lot of things happen. And it's like, if you just did those things more often, then you, you would be, you know, <laughs> you could be the hottest guy at the grocery store if yeah. you prepared like you were going on a date. I'm not saying that that's what people should do. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not some pickup artist, but just from a, you know, a life perspective, mm -hmm. uh, if you're a single man, it probably wouldn't hurt to be good looking walking around your day. Mm -hmm. Definitely wouldn't hurt to be good looking at your office 
or you know at a, at a friend's party these these sorts of things mm. why why not look your best and you probably already know what's you know needed to well, do that and if you I don't think, know then you know ask some women in your life because they'll they'll tell you i think a lot of people know exactly what to do yeah i, I think it's they just they, they, they're yeah. all in mind yeah they want they want me to say something other than the gym yeah, yeah. and they're like oh, oh okay yeah, yeah yeah exactly one thing i found fascinating you said in another podcast and let me see if i can get the wording correctly it was that um, the the physical, the face and, and the attractiveness of a man versus a man that's wounded in terms of like boxing or bruises or, yeah. or disfigured, yeah. which is really interesting because you'd think on on basically a, a, like a like a fundamental level, the man that has more experience fighting is the better fighter. Right. But, you know, being a good fighter, you probably don't get hit, get hit that much. Which I mean, is Floyd int- Mayweather doesn't look particularly beat up. Yeah, um, no. I, but, I mean, there are some great fighters who do. That's that's a terrible anecdote. Um, there's some excellent fighters who have very, very beat up faces. I mean, I've, you know... I've certainly um, paid my dues there. I've definitely yep. lost some, uh, you know, uh, you know, boxing for seven years definitely mm. took away some facial symmetry. And there's some, you know, your intuition isn't entirely wrong. Mm. There is some, uh, this is like, this is, we're talking about one study when it's, I say yeah. some research. There's some research that indicates maybe like a cool facial scar can add to a man's short-term facial attractiveness. Okay, yeah. But that's not... <coughs> You can't really, but you can't, yeah, you can't really know for sure how Mm. much that like a small facial scar might indicate some kind of cues to toughness or something, but but there doesn't seem to be very strong evidence either way for anything like that. Mm. I think that the overall effect that we have to think about is not just, you know, exposure to violence, uh, exposure to suffering violence, but exposure to all of life stresses, diseases, accidents, all the things that could cause asymmetry in the face. Mm -hmm. Just from a game theory perspective, if we're in the police to scene and mm-hmm. it's time to choose a mate and one of them, you know, looks like he's been, you know, run over by a lawnmower. He's been through so many, <coughs> so many difficult experiences and the other guy has gotten through life unscathed, right? If you have to bet, it's like, well, maybe, maybe the reason that that guy's so beat up is because he's this incredible fighter or something, but probably not. Probably the guy who's gotten unscathed <coughs> is... Um, Probably the guy who's gotten through unscathed has uh, made better decisions and been more strategic. I mean, we're not look. We're not a species where it's thank God we're not a species where it's toughest, most muscular, scariest guy wins, wins right? I mean, it's um, <coughs> it's not like there are. Uh, it's I mean, a lot of men think in terms of dominance, physical strength, these sorts of things, and these are certainly attractive traits. I'm not saying they're not, but. You know, there there are lines of women to see the Justin Bieber concert, the Harry Styles concert. There aren't lines of women to see the UFC fighters weigh in, right? There aren't lines of women to see the powerlifting conversa- <coughs> competition, right? <coughs> and these are the most muscular, scariest, God, most dominant men in history, maybe, right? They're this, they're, these, you know, UFC fighters are some of the scary, these boxers, these powerlifters, they're some of the scariest guys that you could imagine, we're not we're not seeing this. We're, we're just not seeing this effect on their attractiveness. So so it's uh, so I, it, I think it is it's, a mixture of like yeah, it's it's overestimated. It's mm. like um, it's like being a pretty boy is pretty pretty close to optimal. Perfect, I like that. Being a somewhat of a chameleon in your social situations, being someone that's a ability to read a room to understand what's going on. And, but, but one of the biggest things this is being able to, one, one of the things I look for is in myself is that I can read the room. I can understand the status. I can understand the, <clears throat> the, 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 the hierarchy very easily and be able to adapt to that from a science perspective on is your social communication from science is there something that you can do or something that you've seen impacts and helps people become more social, become more gregarious, more outgoing? I mean, this is one issue is that it's very easy to give advice on people fixing their looks. Mm -hmm. And this is another thing that I spoke to Alexander about from Date Psych. It's just that it's kind of hard to change your personality. I mean, you certainly Mm -hmm. can, Mm -hmm. but like I was born extremely extroverted. I never made any decisions. I never tried to cultivate that. I... I'm very comfortable talking to complete strangers. I feel zero anxiety doing it. And um, t- yeah, I did nothing to cultivate that. 
So and then there are some people who it's like they're paralyzed with social anxiety mm-hmm. at the thought of not just, you know, talking to a woman, but just talking to people in general. in general. So I wish that I knew some interventions on how to improve that. I'm sure that there's someone who you could have on this podcast <laughs> who would be very good that for would. that, but, um, but I'm not sure. I want to take you through the dating landscape that I saw and I want to see how things have happened and it's changed in your perspective where uh, through COVID everyone pretty much jumped on the dating apps. I don't think there was too many people that weren't on the dating apps, you know, the single people, because that's all we had. And uh, I noticed that, uh, you know, the, the, the community, the guys that were doing well before weren't doing as well because there was a lot more attractive people on, on the apps and stuff mm. like that. And now uh, even after that, uh, the attract more attractive people are still on the dating apps because they found that mating strategy. Mm. As 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 creatures of of well, as, as humans as we are, do you think humans will always find different straight uh, mating strategies? Like if there isn't one available or one gets taken away, we're so adaptable at finding new ones or new ways. In terms of succeeding. Yes. I think that this is, you know, the highest stakes competition there is and people are very motivated to succeed in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Almost everybody wants a mate. There are some people who withdraw from the mating market deliberately. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know how genuine they are about it or whether they're just signaling by doing that. But there are some people who, you know, you know, subscribe to these fringe MG Tao type ideal. I don't know if you've seen that online, but like Mm -hmm. men going their own way, that sort of thing. And they're, you know, deliberately withdrawing from the mating market, essentially. But I would say for the most part, people compete. I don't know about the specifics. That's mm-hmm. a very interesting. Uh, that's a very interesting claim about the the dating apps shifting due mm-hmm. to attractive people coming online during COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's you know it's hard. It's hard to know. It's, it's hard to know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I would say that yes, for the most part, most people will still compete mm. and they'll find their own way. And you know, even if they're not super attractive, I mean, look, if you're not an attractive guy. The dating apps aren't a particularly great place to. I've never used a dating app, but they're not a. They don't look like a particularly great place to compete. Just from the outside, oh, yeah. I mean, it's like if people are comparing photos on these apps, and maybe you know they've <laughs> added some other functionalities. But if they're just comparing photos, if it's a photo competition mm. paired with a number, your height, then it's like that's you know that's gonna be that's gonna be very brutal for someone who's not who's not meeting the those criteria on, on competing on that. Very but there are so. so many other places to compete. Mm, yeah, uh, Instagram's a great one. Instagram's a great one, but also yeah. even the real world, real world. right? Like, um, you know, I, I, I've been dating my girlfriend for, I, I, I've been at least seeing her for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we, I mean, we met we met in the real world, just, yeah. just as one does. Sometimes that happens. Do Actually, you, I would say usually, even still, that probably happens. Do you think that with this uh, in the real world will take it to the next lesson. So do you think it will become more and more prevalent as time goes on or less and less prevalent? I think less prevalent is okay. looks like where the trend is going. But again, mm. I go back to that quote of, you know, only can see six inches further yep. on this point. I don't feel like I can see further at all. Who yeah, knows? Who there, knows tomorrow is. there could be a huge pushback against the dating apps and everyone could say, mm. Oh, we don't want to be involved with this anymore. Yeah. And I would have no expertise as to whether, I mean, there are oh, people who are experts on dating apps specifically. I'm not, I don't know how to predict the trends. It does seem that there was, you know, a huge uptick of dating app usage, and then that's reduced. Yep. But it doesn't seem to be reducing that much further. Mm-hmm. At least uh, that, and that's just based on my that's based on my memory of the mm. last time I looked at that those numbers, the statistics on it. Yeah. In your perspective on on the kind of, is there any good movies that you think really hit the nail on the head in terms of uh, that really show the true representation of? the mating strategies in the world. Oh, that's funny. Unfortunately, I don't really watch movies, to be okay, honest with yeah, you. Yeah. I, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You would be able to, too. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because, uh, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, uh, even even kind of the community that I'm in, it's it, they will gravitate to a couple of movies, right? Oh, which ones? Uh, you got Flight Club. Which oh, is, which yeah, is the a, cult classic. But is that about mating? or No, no not necessarily. That's just yeah. the, the movie. Um, even things like Heat, even things like anything with Al Pacino or Robert De Niro. Oh, interesting. You know? Oh, that, that seems to be about, these movies seem to be, I haven't watched all of them. Mm-hmm. I actually, I don't think I've watched all of any of them. Okay. Meaning that like I've turned it on maybe and then yeah. walked away. Um, just cause I have the, not your thing. Well, I just have the attention. I just have a very short attention span for staying still sure. unless it's something that I'm really engrossed by. Okay. Yeah. Um, but those, 
uh, certainly Fight Club. And, and is Heat about driving? What is Heat about? Uh, Fight Club. It's what is the, Heat about? Oh, Heat is about um, it's Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, and there uh, Al Pacino is the cop. He's finding okay. the, the bank robbers. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So these seem to be movies about just kind of masculinity yeah, very in general much so. and like male-male competition. That's interesting. It, yeah. it seems like there is some cult classics. You've got your, your American Psycho. You've got your Fight Club. Yeah, you a lot of people view American Psycho as aspirational. Um, I read character. part of the book. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen any of the movie, but the clips are just all mm. over the... I mean, isn't this guy a serial killer? Why is yeah, he yeah, looked yeah. up to? It's yeah, pretty, very much so. It's just the um, the blank face, droll nature is like the sigma male archetype uh, of like yeah. what, what it is. Oh okay, okay, cool. On the other side, I found it very fascinating. I I, I I see a lot of girls, and I ask a lot of girls there um, if they listen to murder mysteries mm. when they go to sleep, and and then they they would find that or tell me they like this one or they like the ones about the guys which they find the infatuation about the serial killers and stuff like that where is where does this stem from in our culture yeah that's interesting i mean i'm speculating i've heard some people say that it's similar to the peculiar trait of some prey animals to spy on predators it seems risky but it's useful to gain information about a great threat and so if you're a woman you know you're in a very vulnerable state and so there's this terrible threat, right? Men who kill women. And so it's probably at some level, it just probably feels good to gain information about that. There is for some serial killers and some women who follow those serial killers, there does seem to be a tension of attraction. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer had that, but, they, you know, they cast a heartthrob yeah. um, to yeah. play him. So I don't know how much of that is that. Um, and, you know, Ted Bundy also, again, they cast uh, Zac Efron to mm. play him. And maybe it's the casting causing it, but I think there probably also is an element of these men in real life were mm -hmm. probably quite physically attractive. It's hard to know how much of that is just physically attractive famous man mm -hmm. compensating for, you know, terrible, terrible crimes. And it also doesn't seem to be a big trend in the sense that most women probably, I, you know, I won't even say probably, yeah. the vast majority of women would not want to date a serial killer, yeah, right? That's not, course, that's yeah, not yeah. an attractive archetype. Mm. But then there are a subset of women who, and a subset of men as well, who have, I, I think it's called hebristophilia. Okay. I don't know if that's the pronunciation, but it's, it's certainly yeah, a vague yeah. approximation of the term, which is when you just find not bad boys, or bad girls, but like evil people, right? Mm. You find that class of person attractive. You you like people who commit serious crimes. Mm -hmm. And if you're a famous version of that, then all those people, you're going to be like a bug light towards them. And so I think that that probably, sure. I don't know. I'm really over my skis here speculating, okay, but I think that probably explains the phenomenon. The the idea also is the, um, the Machia Machiavellian traits mm. that, we seem, you know, you're. Uh, I can't even really name all of them, but there was the three biggest ones. Oh, the dark triad. The dark so triads, it's, yeah. um, psychopathy, narcissism, That's Machiavellianism. Awesome. Sometimes psychopathy comes out as attractive, depending on your study methodology. Machiavellianism, uh, not really. Mm -hmm. That that doesn't. It, so to, to define them briefly, narcissism is, and uh, this isn't my area, mm -hmm. but narcissism is this. It's like the stereotype. It's this self-obsession, this excessive mm. self-interest, delusions of grandeur, right? Delusional confidence, these sorts of things. And it's on a spectrum. So you can be more or less narcissistic. You can have clinical narcissism. Then you have Machiavellianism, which is this ability to, you know, the ends justify the means, right? But for whatever you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. I guess Machiavelli, that's probably a bad summary. You have Machiavellianism, which is this capacity to be manipulative and deceitful and scheming to get ahead. And then you have psychopathy, which is callousness, ruthlessness, right? Mm -hmm. Emotional deadness. Narcissism, when you do studies on the dark triad, which often come together, sometimes they do come out as uh, attractive, at least in some contexts, mm -hmm. right? I'm not, I'm not saying that there's no truth to the bad boy thing. But there have been some studies that indicate that it's narcissism that's driving the effect, okay. right? So Machiavellianism, not really. Yep. Psychopathy, maybe, right? Like psycho psychopaths have a higher number of sexual partners, uh -huh. but so do psychopathic women. I, I mean, it, it could just be that 
you know, it could just be that that type of person isn't interested mm -hmm. in a lovely, loving, long-term relationship. You true, and so they end up having you. a lot of flings. But narcissism does seem to drive some attractiveness effect. And the question is why? Well, this is, again, speculation. But part of it could be that narcissists invest more in their physical attractiveness, right? They certainly seem to. And just investing more might make you more physically attractive, and that might come out in something like a speed dating study. Could also be that narcissists come off as very confident, and confidence is controlling for, you know, signs of insecurity and low self-esteem, which are unattractive. So that could be part of why it's attractive. Mm -hmm. It could also be that narcissism just is attractive itself, right? Yeah, it could yeah. be that we're trying to find the sub factors here. It could be that that is a sexy trait. It's a dangerous trait to be attractive to because narcissists have higher rates of infidelity, mm -hmm. right? They tend to not have super successful interpersonal relationships. It's, it's obviously not a great thing to be, to be a narcissist, but there's these suite of traits, the dark triad, that as a whole might have some impact on attractiveness in some contexts. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking specifically in short-term contexts and certainly are attractive to some women, right? Mm -hmm. Some yeah, well, women. Yeah, are, you have to say that. Yeah, yeah, specific women are going to find this attractive. But as a general class of traits, they don't necessarily seem to help except narcissism. Okay, interesting. Yeah. What are some of the studies that you want to perform on the, in, in sort of human mating? Yeah, so well, we just finished up um, my first you know, big study where I was, uh, where I'm, I'm going to be first author, which was on infidelity. And that was just an awesome experience. Yeah. Uh, my co-authors, Candace and Caroline are, are, are both great. And Caroline, and, uh, Caroline was my supervisor at Oxford. Candace is my supervisor here in Melbourne and, you know, studying infidelity. That was, that was a really exciting thing to do. And I'm writing up the study now and it should be, uh, it won't be out next week because academia runs, you know, terribly slowly, but we'll, we'll hopefully about, yeah. have the results available uh, definitely within a year. And Fantastic. it really is that sort of timeline with academia. Yeah, wow. But the write-up will probably be done next week finally because we did some additional data analysis since the, okay. since the yeah. delay. Yeah. Right now I'm interested in a topic that we've been talking about a lot throughout. I'm, I'm really interested in beautification, right? Yeah. The things that people do to make themselves more physically attractive. And so I'm interested in studying... Um, I'm interested in maybe explaining variation in that. Okay. And then probably broadening out to look at mating effort more generally at some point. I'm interested in effort. There's been a lot of research on preferences, yeah. not as much research on effort. effort. And uh, I'm, I'm becoming more and more interested in that. Oh, Thank dang. you for asking. No, no, no I'm, very, I'm, I'm curious because I'm like, I always want to know where it's going. Yeah. It's a, start, it's a topic where... Yeah. But I read about everything, as you can see on my yeah. TikTok. It's like everything to do with uh, human mating behavior. I, I yeah. try to be a generalist, at least within that territory. But as, yeah. as you've seen in, in this conversation, that's at the cost of everything else. You ask me about a question, yeah. even slightly it's, far afield. Field. It doesn't and, work. Uh, yeah, it's like I can tell you about the attractiveness studies on the dark triad, but I couldn't tell you much about the dark triad, uh, dark triad itself. And a lot of that, yeah. uh, I, I should say, I mean, I've been saying his name a lot, but uh, Alexander from Date Psychology, I think he, yeah. he either did a blog or like a super. If you haven't, if you haven't looked at his work, he, he, no, fantastic. So him, Rob Henderson too. Yeah, he's. Yeah. Um, but, but, yeah. I mean, Alexander is just at a completely different level in terms mm. of his study summaries yeah. on Twitter. I mean, I don't even use Twitter. I go on the app and just go to his page to learn because he'll do these mega threads that are essentially incredible literature reviews. And then occasionally he'll also do a blog post that's great. And I can't remember if he's gone that deep on the dark triad, but he's definitely talked about that narcissism thing. So if anyone's interested in that, I'll, I'll give a shout out there. So that's, a, that's a good place to look. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, yeah. a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of the audience are from Money Twitter. We are from that side of Twitter, which is oh, the- so, so one extra follow is uh, at Date Psych. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah, he's, yeah. Uh, he's great. I definitely noticed that too. So we, we usually wrap up with uh, the one question that I get a lot. And it's funny because, you know, for you, science is is at the forefront of all of your answers today. And usually people go on these long-winded things. And, and the question is, but I'd love to see where you, you go with this, is uh, if you could change one thing about the world, Macken, what would that one thing be? Oh God, I don't even want to say. Um. If I could change one thing about the world, this is going to sound just completely out of left field, but I think uh, I think it would be great if people treated animals better. I I, I don't like that people eat animals and uh, you you know cut up their bodies to make mm -hmm. you know leather items and and bags and 
I, I, I don't like the people. I, I, the, the amount of mistreatment that happens in animal agriculture is really upsetting. And if I could just press a button to change one thing really quickly, that would be the, that, that would be a pretty easy one. I'm sure that if I thought more, there would be other things that come to mind. Um, uh, you know what? That's that, that's such a controversial answer, and I don't really feel like controversy. And thinking about it more, I think uh, I think malaria might be the number one killer worldwide. How about we say just malaria doesn't malaria. exist anymore? If I could just change one thing, maybe just malaria doesn't exist. That's and if it's changing several things, then the more controversial answer is definitely on that list, where it's uh, let's let's make us as herbivorous as possible. I love it. Yeah. Mac and Wick, and the people find you. I just Google my name. It'll come up. Mac and Murphy, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you yeah. very much, my Thank friend. You. I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. you having me on. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, this has been great. I really liked it. Perfect.